Father, we're so thankful for your protection and your guidance. Bless us now as we continue to open our minds and our hearts to hear what you have to tell us. The human race has strayed so far and even the church has no idea what it's doing. We know you're going to call a few that will really respond. Help us to be part of that. Bless us now as we read the words that you have caused to be written. May we understand and may we see the position that we need to be in. We're reading the Spirit of Prophecy. The Spirit of Prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So we are reading the thoughts of Jesus himself for his people, and that means the believers, the ones that know that they're listening to his voice. Of course, his voice is in the Bible, and if we don't hear his voice in the Bible, we might as well quit reading, because it is his voice. The Bible is the word of Jesus himself. We're looking at some very difficult statements because it's doubtful that very many people have ever seen them. They've probably never heard them. All right, we're going to uh, begin where we left off. I'm going to read the last paragraph we read to bring us up to date. It was early writings, page 208. Satan had caused the Jews to rebel against God by refusing to receive his son and by staining their hands with his most precious blood. No matter how powerful the evidence now produced that Jesus was the Son of God, the Redeemer of the world, they had murdered him and would not receive any evidence in his favor. They were determined not to listen to any evidence in his favor, as when the Holy Spirit through Stephen declared the mighty evidence of Jesus being the Son of God. They stopped their ears lest they should be convinced. Satan had the murderers of Jesus fast in his grasp. Now, those are fearful words. We know it's history. We've always known it's history that the Jews did that. They murdered Jesus using the Romans to get it done. But we were never taught that the reason they murdered Jesus was because he said he was the Son of God. And when we think about that, how many people in the world that call themselves Christians are in exactly the same position as those murderers? And it's really difficult to, to internalize this. Because today, if we know anything at all about churchgoers, we know some of them by their first names. How do you deal with that? All right, so let's pick it up. False theories will be mingled with every phase of experience and advocated with satanic earnestness in order to captivate the mind of every soul who is not rooted and grounded in a full knowledge of the sacred principles of the word. Now, I want to remind us here that we are looking at the problem, the real problem. The real problem is not doctrines, no matter how important they are. 
Having wrong doctrines is only a symptom of the problem. We're listening to the problem here, and every time we look at it, Satan is behind it. False theories. Do we know anything about false theories? It says the people who get into those do it with satanic earnestness. In the very midst of us. Who's us? The remnant church. (laughs) The last church of God on this earth. Jesus is telling us in the very midst of the last church will arise false teachers giving heed to seducing spirits. There's the devil again. Whose doctrines are of satanic origin. These teachers in our midst, these teachers will draw away disciples after themselves. Creeping in unawares, they will use flattering words and make skillful misrepresentations with seductive tact. So this is a a deception that these false teachers in our church bring along and people enjoy it. Seductive. They enjoy it. They like it. They want it. They will support it. They believe it. Now you'll notice that Ellen White did not write down this could happen. (laughs) This is a possibility. She didn't say that. She said will be. There's no way to get around this. In her day it was will be. What do you suppose today is? has happened. It's here. That's Manuscript Releases, Volume 11, page 205. Okay, reading again, different quotation. It says, To every soul will come the searching test. Does that include me? This is every soul. So nobody in the Seventh-day Adventist Church is going to be left out of this. Every soul will come. There's that word will again. The searching test. Here's the question. Shall I obey God rather than men? That's the test. 20 million Seventh-day Adventists have to take that test. Am I going to obey God or men? The decisive hour is even now at hand. Are our feet planted on the rock of God's immutable word? Are we prepared To stand firm in defense of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Does anybody know what the faith is? It's part of the test. How can we pass the test if we don't know what the faith is? It's got something to do with the commandments of God. They wouldn't be together if they weren't. This is Great Controversy, page 593. Next quote. Those that are in derision uttered the words, He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Did Jesus say that? Well, of course he did. Was it true? It's only true to a believer. Jesus said, I am the Son of God. He forgot to say, I just meant a metaphor. 
I am the Son of God. Little thought that their testimony would sound down the ages. Although spoken in mockery, never were words more true. Those who placed Christ before the world, hanging on the cross between two thieves, bruised and wounded, bore a testimony to his work. Their words, heard by thousands, led men to search the scriptures. Now, it's amazing to me that Alan White did not say it led men to go ask their rabbis. That did not happen to the honest souls. They didn't go to the rabbis. That's who said it. They went to the Word of God. And that it was... Oh, I'm sorry, I was skipped. Uh, let men search the Scriptures for themselves. Don't go ask a minister. Don't go ask a church. Don't go read commentaries. Don't go any place. Read the Scriptures. Here's a sentence that should really provoke us. Wise men heard. They searched, pondered, and prayed. Now, every one of us can do those things. Every one of us. And it's what we must do or somebody's going to fool us. That's the way it is. God will never mock us. If we read the words of Jesus and let His Spirit teach us, we're going to have to think about it. And the thoughts that we're going to come up with are not going to be pleasant ones at first. The, f the first thing we have to think about is, how come this is not what I'm hearing? Why don't the teachers in the church teach this? God teaches it. It's in His Word. And as we ponder and meditate and pray, it's going to hit us. I'm not responsible to them for anything. I'm responsible to God. And He knows everything that's going on inside of me. <laughs> he knows. I can't fool Him. That's Manuscript 45, 1897. Uh, paragraph 6, if you need the paragraph. Next statement. There is no greater evidence that Satan is working. Do you want to know what that is? <laughs> There is no greater evidence that Satan is working than that men who profess to be sanctified to God's service persecute their fellow beings because they do not believe the same doctrines that they themselves believe. How much of this do you have to hear before you know what's gone wrong? <laughs> She says, there's no greater evidence. Go listen to that man who doesn't like it that you don't believe what he believes. He's the teacher. And he's got some power and he uses that power to persecute the people that don't agree with him. Now I'm reading you inspired words. These are the words of Christ through Ellen White. Do you know why people don't read Ellen White? <laughs> they might bump into some of these. Continuing, Jesus seemed to know the scriptures from beginning to end, and he presented them in their true import. The rabbis were ashamed to be instructed by a child. They claimed it was their office 
to explain the scriptures. And that it was his place to accept their interpretation. <laughs> this is the author of the Bible. <laughs> yes. Jesus is the author. It's not a third God that doesn't that doesn't exist. That never happens. There's no such thing as another author. The author is Jesus Christ Himself. The Word of God is the Word of Jesus. So Jesus, the author, was listening to their explanations, but he wouldn't accept them. Why not? <laughs> because he knew what they really meant. But they were telling him, no, we're the teachers, you have to listen to us. We explain the scriptures to you. We're the leaders of the church. They were indignant that he should stand in opposition to their word. Desire of Ages 85. All these statements are in places where everybody can see them. I had a minister sit in that chair and tell me he read through the modern version of Desire of Ages and it was a real blessing to him. I don't think he read this sentence. As a matter of fact, I read him a sentence just to see what he would do with that. It was an illustration about a mother becoming indignant of her child drowning in the water and people standing around, nobody did anything. And he says, oh, where is that? Desire of ages. How can we read books and not know what's in them? Next quote. But God will have. There's another will. That's the will I really like. <laughs> God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only. Yes, Jesus is going to have a people. He has them on the earth right now. A people that will not listen to what men say and believe it without checking. The Bible is where they go. The Bible is the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. The opinions of learned men, that's scholars to us. The deductions of science, that's theology to us. The creeds of decisions, creeds, that's the church manual to us. The creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, that's the vote of the general council, the general conference. As numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority, that's over 50%, right? <laughs> the voice of the majority, not one nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Any point. Throw them all away. They're no good for anything. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord. She did not say request. We should demand. And if you ever tell a person you must have a Bible text or you're not going to believe it, you're going to make a lot of people mad. Maybe I shouldn't add the comments because if you do any of this, you're going to discover it all for yourself. Nobody needs to tell you. It'll be part of your experience. All right. Let's read some more. Satan. There's, there goes again Satan. He's always the one. Satan is constantly endeavoring to attract the attention of to man in place of God. He leads the people. Satan leads the people to look to bishops, to pastors, 
to professors of theology. She just is a missing issue. As their guides, instead of searching the scriptures to learn their duty for themselves, then by controlling the minds of these leaders, he, Satan, he can influence the multitudes according to his will. He can do whatever he wants with the church if he gets the leaders. Now, I am not reading fairy tales to you here. I am not reading possibilities to you. I am reading facts. These are laws that if Satan gets the leaders, he's got the church. Continuing. These opponents of Jesus were men whom the people had been taught from infancy to reverence, to whose authority they had been accustomed implicitly to bow. How is it, they asked, that our rulers and learned scribes do not believe on Jesus? How is it that these men who are spiritual leaders, how come they don't believe in Jesus? How come they don't believe he's the Son of God? Would not these pious men receive him if he were the Christ? It was the influence of such leaders that led the Jewish nation to reject their Redeemer. It was the leaders of the church that led the people to reject him as the Son of God. This is hidden in some exotic book, I know, so nobody ever saw it. It's great controversy. 595. Has anybody ever read the controversy? I'm going to read the next page now. There's so much in this chapter. Go read the chapter. The Roman Church reserves to the clergy the right to interpret the scriptures. It's their right. What church? The devil's church. The Roman church. The masterpiece of Satan, it says in Great Controversy, page 50. Continuing. On the ground that ecclesiastics alone are competent to explain God's word, it is withheld from the common people. Though the Reformation gave the scriptures to all, yet the selfsame principle which was maintained by Rome pre prevents multitudes of Protestant churches from searching the Bible for themselves. They are taught to accept its teachings as interpreted by the church. Do you see the problem? We have been following Satan's plan of salvation instead of Jesus' plan of salvation. And it comes from the churches. Do you know there are people wandering around on all these streets that won't step foot in a church because they're too smart? They know there's something wrong in those churches. Yes, yes. Don't look at them like they're kind of some stupid people who are denying salvation. They're not. They're smart people, most of them. They know there's something wrong with those churches. And some of us are just beginning to realize even God's last church has the problem. 
There are thousands, no, millions, maybe it was thousands in her day, millions. There are thousands who dare receive nothing, however plainly revealed in Scripture, that is contrary to their creed or the established teaching of their church. And you thought the Adventist church was different all the time, didn't you? You always believed that. Until one day you woke up. And you know what? It got you in trouble, didn't it? And if it hasn't gotten you in trouble, it's because you're being really quiet. Nobody knows what you're thinking. <laughs> yeah. But if people know what you know, that's Great Controversy 596. New quote. At his birth, the angel star in the heavens had known Christ and had conducted the seers to the manger where he lay. The heavenly host had known him and sung his praise over the plains of Bethlehem. The sea had acknowledged his voice and was obedient to his command. Disease and death had recognized his authority and yielded their prey to his demand. The sun had known him and hidden its face of light from the sight of his dying anguish. The rocks had known him and shivered into fragments at his dying cry. Although inanimate nature recognized the bore testimony of Christ that he was the Son of God, that's what she makes out of the thing. They all testified in animate nature that he was the son of God, yet the priests and the rulers knew not the Savior. They rejected the evidence of his divinity and they steeled their hearts against his truths. They were not so susceptible as the granite rocks of the mountains. That's Spirit Prophecy, Volume 3, page 170. New quote. Even if Jesus were innocent, urged the high priest, he must be put out of the way. Even if they would recognize that he was right, that everything he said was true. He still had to be, be put out of the way. Why? He was troublesome. He was drawing people to himself and lessening the authority of the rulers. He was only one. It was better he should die then the, the authority of the rulers should be weakened. If the people were to lose confidence in the rulers, the national power would be destroyed. The church would be gone because the people didn't believe the ministers anymore. That's Desire of Ages, another strange book. <laughs> Desire of Ages, page 539. Next quote. Unbelief, having once been cherished, continued to control the men of Nazareth. Do you remember? They loved what he said at first. But then he told them they weren't spiritual and they didn't like him anymore. And all of a sudden they said, he can't be the Messiah. Can't be him at all. So now once they said it, once they said he is not the Son of God, let's see what God happens next. So, it controlled the Sanhedrin and the nation. But with priests and people, the first rejection, the first rejection of the demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power was the beginning of the end. In order to prove that their first resistance was right, they continued ever after 
to Kabul. They couldn't change. Once they rejected Jesus being the Son of God and they said so, they couldn't turn it around in their own mind. In order to prove, I said that, okay, their rejection of the Spirit culminated in the cross of Calvary. That's where it goes. Get rid of him. It culminated in the destruction of their city in the scattering of the nation to the winds of heaven. That first rejection did all of that. Jesus is telling us laws. These are laws of human nature. These are laws of his kingdom. Nobody's going to turn on th these kinds of things around. It's the way things work. Oh, how Christ longed to open to Israel the precious treasures of the truth. But such was their spiritual blindness that it was impossible to reveal to them the truths relating to his kingdom. Impossible for who? Impossible for Jesus. He couldn't do it. They clung to their creed and their useless ceremonies. Is anybody who thinks they should be keeping the feasts listening? Their useless ceremonies when the truth of heaven awaited their acceptance. They spent their money for chaff and husks when the bread of life was within their reach. Why did they not go to the word of God and search diligently to know whether they were in error? You see, that's the second part of the equation. The rulers are responsible for what they do. They're deceiving the whole church. But people are only deceived when they want to be deceived. So if a person is deceived, it's because they are not going to the Word of God for themselves. They're letting the rulers deceive them because they're lazy. And maybe they don't have a love for truth. We're not going to talk about that one today. Truth was unpopular in Christ's day. It is unpopular in our day. It has been unpopular ever since Satan first gave man a disrelish for it, presenting fables that lead to self-exaltation. Do we not today meet theories and doctrines that have no foundation in the Word of God? Men cling as tenaciously to them as did the Jews to their traditions. The Jewish leaders were filled with spiritual pride. Their desire for the glorification of self manifested itself even in the service of the sanctuary, even in the way they did church. They loved the highest seats in the synagogue. They loved greetings in the marketplaces and were gratified with the sound of their titles on the lips of men. Oh, Dr. So-and-so. Oh, Pastor So-and-so. As real piety declined, they became more jealous for their traditions and their ceremonies. Desire of ages Pages 241 and 242. The same masterful mind that plotted against the faithful in ages past is still seeking to rid the earth of those who fear God and obey His law. Do you mean there's somebody doing it? You know what the Bible calls them? The righteous. Oh, there's nobody righteous. Everybody's filthy rags. Well, everybody who's not righteous is filthy rags, yes. <laughs> the righteous are righteous. Because they have Jesus. And if you think Jesus doesn't have righteousness, you have a real problem. Yes. 
That's when you get Jesus, you get righteousness. Satan will excite indignation against the humble minority who conscientiously refuse to accept popular customs and traditions. They refuse. That's volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 540. You want to get into that little book sometime. That book is loaded with things we need to know. Next quote. Misled by the false statements of Haman, Xerxes was induced to issue a decree providing for the massacre of all the Jews, scouted abroad and dispersed among the people in the provinces of the Medo Persian kingdom. <clears throat> a certain day was appointed on which the Jews were to be destroyed and their property confiscated. Little did the king realize the far-reaching results that would have accompanied the complete carrying out of this decree. Satan himself, the hidden instigator of this scheme, was trying to rid the earth of those who preserved the knowledge of the true God. That's what Satan is trying to do today, but he can't get away with it. To get rid of the earth of the people who are preserving the knowledge of the true God. That's Prophets and Kings, page 600. Next. By causing men to violate the second commandment, Satan aimed to degrade their conceptions of the divine being. By setting aside the fourth, he would cause them to forget God altogether. Now please, listen to the Spirit. That word God does not mean the Father in many contexts. The word God means Jesus. Let's see what we're reading here. It has to do with the fourth commandment. She says to get rid of the fourth commandment is to get rid of God. Let's read. God's claim to reverence and worship above the gods of heathen is based upon the fact that He is the Creator. Who's the creator? Jesus. She just called Jesus God. Now let's see what else she says. And that to him all beings owe their existence. Thus it is presented in the Bible. Does the Bible say Jesus is the creator? Yeah. John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, Ephesians. Yeah, the Bible says it over and over. So, it says, she says, thus it is presented in the Bible. Uh, says the prophet Jeremiah. Now hold on to something. You're not used to this one. You may never have heard it before. I don't know. Hold on. Says the prophet Jeremiah, the Lord in the Old Testament, the word Lord is Jehovah. So she's quoting Jeremiah, the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. What? What did she say? Jehovah of the Old Testament. Exodus 3 is very clear. Jehovah is Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the creator. She's quoting Jeremiah in the context of Jesus is God. 
The Lord Jehovah is the true God. Now, I'm not going to try to explain any of this today. Someday, maybe, if we get enough questions on this. But we're going to start reading some things that you cannot put your tongue around or your brain around because you're listening to people who don't know what they're saying about this. Let's keep reading. That's Patriarchs and Prophets. 336. Next one. The Son of God was the heir of all things and the dominion and glory of the kingdoms of this world were promised to him. Yet when he appeared in this world, it was without riches or splendor. The world understood not his union with the Father. The excellency and the glory of his divine character were hid from them. He was therefore despised and rejected of men, and did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Even as Christ was in the world, so are his followers. You mean you, you're going to live the same way here that, and be treated the way Jesus was? Yes. If people perceive you as a Christian, you're going to get just what they gave to Jesus. They are the sons of God and joint heirs with Christ and the kingdom and dominion belong to them. The world understood not their character and holy calling. They perceived not their adoption into the family of God. Their union and fellowship with the Father and the Son is not manifest and while the world behold their humiliation and reproach it does not appear what they are or what they shall be they are strangers the world know them not and appreciate not the motives which activate them another Christian does but the world does not know who they are the world is ripening for its destruction. God can bear with sinners but a little longer. They must drink the dregs of the cup of his wrath, unmixed with mercy. Those who will be heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ to the immortal inheritance will be peculiar. There's another will. No, almost. Will be peculiar. Yes, so peculiar that God places a mark upon them. You know what the mark is? It's the signature of Jesus himself. He writes his name in our forehead. Who does he write his name in the forehead of? true Sabbath keepers because the Sabbath says Jesus is the creator and he is their God. Is this starting to make a little more sense as we go on here? Every meeting we're trying to lay on just a little bit more so we can see what's really being said. We can't just let out in one chunk. Nobody can get it that way. But we can begin to put it together, yes. Jesus is the creator, and he is. Even though the church says the Father, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit is the creator, the Bible never says that. Spirit of prophecy never says that. That's just what the church says. Jesus is the creator. He says, my Sabbath, Ezekiel 20.20. 20. My Sabbath. He didn't say our Sabbath. My Sabbath. My Sabbaths. Read with the idea of getting some information out of it when you're reading. Don't just assume you know what's being said. Ask some questions. Say, why did that say my Sabbath if Jesus is the creator? It's because it's his Sabbath. <laughs> Read our ages sometimes, page 289, carefully. 
Read the first chapter of Desire of Ages carefully. All the stuff is said there. It's always been there. Those. Okay. So peculiar that God places a mark upon them as His. Holy His. Do you want the mark? <laughs> yes, when Jesus puts that mark on us, He says to the universe in all time, He's mine. <laughs> Completely mine. Think ye that God will receive honor and acknowledge a people so mixed up with the world that they differ from them only in name? Read again Titus 2, verses 13 to 15. It is soon to be known who is on the Lord's side who will not be ashamed of Jesus. Those who have not moral courage to conscientiously take their position in the face of unbelievers leave the fashions of the world and imitate the self-denying life of Christ are ashamed of Him and do not love His example. 1 Testimonies 2.68 Okay, we have to... That's all I'm going to read in the vein of those kinds of quotations. There are many, many more. I only wrote a certain amount of them down so we could look at them. But there are many more. There's only one message here. The Jews blew it because of their leaders. They departed from God they would not receive Jesus as the Son of God. And the people loved it and said, we'll believe anything you say because you have the power of excommunication and I need this church to go to heaven. What a mistake. Oh, where do I want to go? Okay, I want to go to 18, 197. I wasn't going to do this today, but we have a few minutes here. The title of this little section is Our Message. Now, we've already covered justification by faith. That's our message, okay? Righteousness, that's our message. Righteousness by faith is not our message. That's a false message. Justification by faith, righteousness of Jesus. All right. Now she says they. She didn't title it. She somebody else titled it our message. But let's see what she says. The third angel's message, embracing the messages of the first and second angels, is the message for this time. Okay, third angel. We are to raise aloft the banner on which is described the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That's our banner. That's what we're supposed to be teaching the world. You can only keep the commandments of God when you receive the righteousness of Christ. But if you don't keep the commandments of God, you're not going to heaven. We don't teach that to anybody. We teach people, just believe in Jesus, you're covered. No, because if you don't believe Jesus gives you the power to keep the Ten Commandments, you're believing in the wrong Jesus. The commandments of God, that's our message. Why do we teach people the Ten Commandments? So they can disobey them? <laughs> Isn't that stupid? The only reason you tell the people the Ten Commandments is so they can obey, and the only way they can obey is to get the faith of Jesus. So, let's see. Let's see what she's saying here. The world is soon to meet the great lawgiver over his broken law. This is not the time to put out of sight the great issues. Woo! The great issues before us. God calls upon his people to magnify the law and make it honorable. God, his people. Who is that? His, his people, his church. 
His people. God. God calls upon His people to magnify the law and make it honorable. You do not honor God by saying, oh, nobody can keep the law of God. You're honoring Satan when you talk like that. God has a people on this earth who believe in the Bible and will not take anybody's traditions or customs. And they are here to magnify the law. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, the Sabbath was given to the world that man might ever remember that in six days God created. Yeah, you know what that says now. The fourth commandment is telling us Jesus is the creator. He's God. God created the world. He rested upon the seventh day, blessing it as the day of his rest, and he gave it to the beings he had created. Now, have you ever heard the concept that only the Creator can redeem us? Of course you have. Well, the Creator is Jesus. Jesus is our Redeemer. He gave it to the beings He had created that they might remember Him as the true and living God. Are you ready to go home and cry now? People are being taught out there that the Father is the only true God, living God, and that means Jesus can't be a God. If there's only one and it's the Father, who's Jesus? People are not reading John 17, 3 the way Jesus said it and meant it. Let's continue reading here. Did you re remember where we're reading? Volume 8 of the Testimonies. Why was Volume 8 of the Testimonies written? It's because John Harvey Kellogg was destroying the personality of the Father and the Son. This statement is trying to tell us who the Father and the Son are, but she's doing it from the point of view of creation, and she says Jesus is the true living God. Now you can go home and wrestle with that for a while. By his mighty power, notwithstanding the opposition of Pharaoh, God delivered his people. Who delivered the people? It's Jesus. And that they might keep the law which had been given in Eden. He brought them to Sinai to hear the proclamation of this law by proclaiming the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel with His own voice. God, the only voice I, those Hebrews ever heard was the voice of Jesus. They never heard the Father's voice. Jesus spoke the Ten Commandments to the Hebrew people with His own voice. That's what He just said. He demonstrated their importance. In awful grandeur, He made known His majesty and authority as ruler of the world. Now, the Ten Commandments on that occasion was not given as a sign for His authority to rule all the universe. He was giving it to the Hebrews for this world. Okay? Now, I believe in Genesis 1, yes, it's for all the universe. I'm not going to go into that. But she making a point here that Jesus was proclaiming to the Hebrews, He's the ruler of this world. Jesus, their God. In awful grandeur, He made known His majesty and authority as ruler of the world. This he did to impress the people with the sacredness of his law and the importance of obeying it. 
the power and glory with which the law was given reveal its importance. Listen to this sentence now. If people want to argue that we're doing some false interpretation here, listen to this statement. It is the faith. It is the faith once delivered to the saints by Christ. She just said he's the one who spoke the Ten Commandments and she called him God. It is the faith once delivered to the saints by Christ, our Redeemer, speaking from Sinai. It was Jesus speaking <laughs> on Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, according to Ellen White. Now, you're either going to believe the spirit of prophecy or you're just going to believe your own interpretations of things. We are starting to move into some pretty heavy waters here. We're going to have to start doing some thinking. I know that's painful sometimes, but we're going to have to do some thinking, and we're going to have to do some praying, we're going to have to do some meditating. We're going to have to let Jesus talk to us, because you don't get this by going to law school. He has to talk to you individually, personally. And your thoughts have to start coming to light. And, and lights have to come on. And you have to start realizing, I've been listening to too many people who have no idea what they're saying. By the observance of the Sabbath, this is the next page. By the observance of the Sabbath, the children of Israel were to be distinguished from all other nations. Verily, my Sabbath you shall keep. Christ said. <laughs> my Sabbaths. They belong to Christ. She just said, Christ said, my Sabbaths. Don't listen to people who want to tell you a different story. They're still Trinitarians. We've got to stop being Trinitarians and believe the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. And we're just starting to realize, I think, there are things I don't understand here. Yes, of course you don't. <laughs> Do you think it was, it was so easy to understand it by hearing it one time that nobody else in the world, uh, well, well, actually, that's what the way it is. The people in the world don't understand because it does take more than one time. <laughs> and it's going to take more than one time for us. Christ said, it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know I am. Jehovah. That's what it says in the Bible, Ezekiel. The 20th chapter, verse 13. That you may know that I am Jehovah that does sanctify you. It's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days Jehovah made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout the generations for a perpetual covenant. The Sabbath is the issue because unless you keep the Sabbath spiritually, you will never understand Jesus is the Son of God and He is Jehovah. The Sabbath is a sign of the relationship existing between God and His people, Jesus and His people. A sign that they are his obedient subjects. And if they don't believe in obedience, what, what good is their religion? That they keep his holy law. The observance of the Sabbath is the means ordained by God, by Jesus, of preserving a knowledge of himself. And of distinguishing between his loyal subjects and the transgressors of his law. This is the faith! What's delivered to the saints? That's Jude, of course. The faith! The faith is keeping the commandments of God of which the Sabbath is the central point because that keeps us in the knowledge that Jesus is a son of God and that he himself is Jehovah. He himself is a true God. That's all I'm going to say on that subject today. 
there are people. I don't know if you're aware of it. I wouldn't be aware except people keep sending me things. I don't cruise the web. I don't look at meetings. I don't listen to what's going on out there. The only reason I know is people send me things. And some of the things I'm getting are downright shocking to me. Because there are things being taught in the name of the Father and Son that are not in the Bible. And when a person does that, what makes them any better than a Trinitarian, which is not in the Bible? Now, I'm not calling people names because I never name anybody. I don't do that. I don't believe in it. I don't want to embarrass anybody. I don't want to cause anybody any problems. But we have a message here. People, we all need to study for ourselves. If you think it's dangerous to listen to a minister, think how dangerous it is to listen to somebody who's never studied, really, the things that at least ministers have to study. So, now we see the problem. It's an unspiritual ministry, and it's an unspiritual people. No one is more to blame than the other. We are never going to say to Jesus, He made me do it. <laughs> it's never going to work. You know, Jesus is going to ask the Satan the, the, the big question, Why? Why did you rebel? And we all know the answer, don't we? It's a big, fat silence because there's no reason. There never has been a reason. There's never going to be a reason when Jesus asks, Why? All a person can do is just stand there with big silence. And that's going to be the most awful feeling in the world because the next thing Jesus says is, Depart from me. You workers of iniquity, I never knew you. We don't need that. Jesus says there will be a people who stay in the Bible. And they will not listen to man's traditions. This be one of those. Father, how I must pain your heart that after all you have given, which is everything, and there's nothing more you could do, men still listen to your word as though it was some kind of a, a TV show or a play. Something just to be entertained by. Help us to hear your voice, to sense the fellowship and to know it's the most important thing in all eternity that we be your friends. Bless us as we continue to have our hearts and minds opened by your Spirit. Amen.